that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Hey everyone, just a, a quick intro before we get started. What you're about to hear here, hear here, hear here, hear here, hear here. What you're about to hear is, uh, man, I love this one, Ryan. I think this was your favorite event from the first wave of the tour. Am, oh, I, am I right? Oh my God. I mean, the the way the Boston crowd made it made me feel when we got on stage. Uh, everyone was like, just we were all on the same page. It was just really, really. Um, I'm going to say awesome, but I, I overuse that word so much. It truly was awesome, though. Yeah, I mean, this is an appropriate use for that word. I remember we got out on, on the stage, and there's, what, over a thousand people there for sure. And, and like, they the crowd was just great. The questions were engaging and thoughtful. and They laughed at all my jokes. <laughs> and they did. Even the ones that were your normal jokes. Yeah, well, they would disagree with you. <laughs> they were outstanding jokes. Uh, yeah, well, it was, it was a great event. It was, you know what? It's very rare that I can say, like, we do four events in a row like we did this last wave, and all of them were outstanding. But I do feel that way, all mm. four of these. And we're releasing all four as, as podcasts. And I've gotten, a, I don't know about you, but I've gotten a bunch of really good feedback on the Twitters, at JFM. A lot of people have been, been tweeting me just saying, Hey, I really love seeing how you people interact. You people. And I said, who, what do you mean? You people, you mean minimalists? <laughs> do you think all minimalists look the same <laughs> just cause we have great hair? <laughs> no, they're like, you know what? I really enjoy watching how, how you and Ryan interact with people sort of live this, this tete a tete. We usually take callers on the podcast, which I love doing that as well, but they're not it's not direct callers necessarily. Uh, although we are building a, a podcast studio right now and we're, we're in the process of doing it. We're, we need some funding for that. So we just started a Patreon page. If you want to support us, help us do the studio thing and also do a video or film studio. So we can add a video component to that. We can also do new cool video stuff like mini documentaries and interviews and bring guests on, but also we can take live callers. So if you like how we're interacting with people, but with radically improved audio uh, audio quality, then if you would just support us on Patreon, <laughs> what? Adio. I said, well, yeah. It's because we were just in Boston. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, that is racist. <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, no, I um, if you if I want to interact with people on the phone, but we need the audio equipment or the audio equipment for those of you in Boston. Um, God, Ryan, that is so bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we started. Oh, come on, dude! That one dude he came up to us after the oh, after yeah. the boss event. What he was say? like, he's like, he what did he say? Uh, uh, something about how it's, you know, there's a Bostonian saying. He was like, and he like laid on the accent really thick. He was like, "You guys are a wicked pisser." <laughs> 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 Sir, did you just come here from Belfast? Uh, which I hope to make it back to Belfast be next awesome. year. That would be really great. Anyway, uh, the Boston event was outstanding. For those of you listening at home, if you want to support us, we're looking for 1% support. So if 1% of our listeners can support us, that's just over 5,000 people. Actually, it, we that's probably half of 1%. You all contribute a million dollars a piece. No, no, no. It's a dollar, Ryan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a dollar or two bucks. Uh, what we're trying to get, what we're trying to do is is get one or two dollars per episode so that we can build the studio so if you want to support us welcome first off to our first 200 or so patreon supporters if you want to go over just to patreon.com slash the minimalist we're doing some cool things for our patreon supporters as well we're going to do a monthly uh, live stream where you can interact with the minimalist you can ask us questions and participate uh, it's only for our patreon supporters uh, if you're doing two bucks or more per episode but also it's really cool patreon allows you to cap allows you to cap your monthly uh, usage or your, or your monthly contribution to any any um, of any place that you contribute to. So if you and I were to start like putting out 30 episodes a month all of a sudden, that'd be great as long as they were all good, meaningful creations. 
we're not going to expect you to contribute to all 30 of those. So you can put a cap if you want to, that's great. But basically all we're saying is if you want to contribute to the cause, be part of the 1%, help us build the studio. None of that money goes to me and Ryan. It all goes to either pay a salary for Sean and you can help support his family that way. Podcast Sean is our producer or uh, just as important. It helps us uh, fund the equipment that we need. 2000 supporters gets us the audio studio that we need. 5,000 gets us the video component, allows us to hire a full-time filmmaker as well. So we can create a lot more meaningful videos for you. You can find the details of that on our Patreon page or just go to theminimalists.com and uh, click on the donate button up there. You can find all the ways to support the the podcast. Ryan, do I have, oh yeah, we're, we're hitting the road again already. You were gone for a while. You and I just recorded a podcast episode about your trip to Tokyo. Hopefully that will, will be out really soon. That was supposed to be the original intro to the Boston podcast. We end up talking for like an hour instead <laughs> because you and I hadn't caught up yet. Like you literally, did you sleep at all? Oh, dude. I, I, your I got, your I schedule got, has to be so off right now. I got, uh, I'm all right, dude. I got okay, up admit, Well, I, I tried not to sleep on the plane mm. on the way back. So it was like an 18 hour trip back, which actually the layovers were like six hours. It's really, it wasn't that bad. Okay. Of, of like time in the air. Um, I got, we got back. Uh, I went to, I went, Mar- Mariah and I went to sleep. Dude, this is crazy. Mariah and I went to sleep at 1.30 a.m. I guess that would make it Sunday morning. We got back Saturday night at like 11 p.m. and then went to sleep at like 1.30 a.m. Right. Early Sunday morning, technically. And I didn't set an alarm and I'm like, oh, you know, like I'm getting an eight, nine hours sleep. Woke up at 3 p.m. yesterday, <laughs> mountain time. So you actually went to bed last night still. Yeah. And then, yeah. So, and then I went to, yeah. And then I went to bed at like 10 p.m. and woke up at, I don't know, 10 30 p.m. Went, and got up at like six o'clock a.m. Oh, wow. I man. feel good, dude. Yeah. That's great, man. Not I'm, I'm happy sleeping. To that. that is not sleeping. It doesn't take away the jet lag altogether. But like, I feel totally fine now, dude. But like not sleeping on the plane, on those long plane rides like that to me, we did that on the way over to Tokyo. It helped out a ton. Again, mm. it took me a day or two to like get into the rhythm to adjust, but it wasn't like that for every hour d- time difference. It takes a day. I mean, I was not, you know, by the third or fourth day, I was fine. Right. So, so we did a whole episode on our sort of media follow up. We did a media episode. And so the episode we just recorded that we're not going to air just yet, but we'll try to put out maybe later this week or next week or sometime. We wanted to get this Boston event out to you because it was it was outstanding and and so um we'll we'll have to hold off on that um but we're going to a bunch of other places as well as we're recording this we're getting ready to go over to spokane there's still tickets available to that we're headed to portland and seattle as well both of those are sold out um so if you're in either one of those cities and you still want to see us road trip to spokane it's not that far we're driving uh we're driving from from missoula we were actually supposed to do an event in missoula but we booked the wrong venue we booked a thousand seat venue there's sixty seven thousand people in missoula and i like to think highly of myself (laughs) but it was my fault for not pushing back on on our wonderful booking agent and their whole team i I I just love that we believed in ourselves enough he believed in us enough yeah and we were overstretching a little bit but uh i mean bob dylan can get a thousand people in Missoula. Josh, what? We're not Bob Dylan. Yeah, we're not even a one third of Bob Dylan, which means, and there's two of us. Dave Chappelle Ryan, sold Ryan, out. Ryan, how do you feel that you're not even one sixth of Bob Dylan? Dave Chappelle sold out three nights in a row of the Denison Theater. Here in, in, in Missoula? In Missoula, yeah. yeah. And that, yeah, I dude, I mean, that. like, we're not, we're not even one twentieth of Dave Chappelle. <laughs> <laughs> we're from the same area, though. Dayton, Ohio, baby. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to this next wave. Jess is coming out. Sean is coming out. And, um, and then from there, oh, and, and Matt and Conrad are coming out to film some stuff, too. We're working on the next film project. We're not going to tell you what it is yet, but we are super excited for that. We're not even going to tell you what format it is or where it's going to be. But we hope that it's going to be outstanding. Uh, we 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 followed a similar recipe last time. We we filmed something and it became this documentary that really spread the message. We hope the next thing will carry that message even even farther. Stay tuned for that. And then after uh, those two sold out events, there are still tickets left for the next wave. We'll be in Grand Rapids. Then we'll be in Chicago. That one's really close selling out if it hasn't already. And then from there, Madison, Wisconsin, and Minneapolis. I know there's a few seats left in Minneapolis, but but not many. I think in Minneapolis, just a heads up, it's just the VIP seating. Oh, okay. So let's talk about that real quick, just to add some clarity. So that first wave, the first four cities, we did these separate VIP events before the the show, in addition to giving you the the good seating or whatever. That didn't work out very well, and so we we learned a lesson from that. Uh, just like the Missoula lesson we learned, don't book a thousand seat theater in a ladies and gentlemen. Town Josh that, and I 
fail miserably still. Yeah, all the time. And, the and secret is, is you learn from it. Yes. So yeah. we probably won't do VIP city seating, or if we do, it'll be something completely different. We'll the, do VIP seating, but not VIP events. Yeah, yeah. If we, yeah, the next time we do a tour, probably not going to book the Denison Theodore Theod- Theodore Theater. <laughs> Alvin, <laughs> unless, Simon, unless, Theodore. Unless, Theodore. <laughs> unless Theodore. Unless all of a sudden. Do. I become more than one sixth of Bob Dylan. <laughs> All right, we're, we're, we've digressed terribly. Anyway, uh, yes, um, VIP events. Uh, we're going to do better than just doing a little VIP event beforehand. If you get a VIP ticket to any of our events, we're going to do three things for you this time. A, you get the best seats in the house, even if it's general admission, we have reserved seating for the folks who buy a VIP ticket uh second thing we're going to do is we'll give you all of our copies of all of our books if you want them that's totally optional and if you don't want them then you can pass on it obviously if you want it read it and then pass it on to someone else who will get value from it whether that's a library or a friend or family member someone else who will get value from it and third after the event it's free to to join the meet and greet that we didn't want to do a separate meet and greet for vip people because we like to meet and greet everyone after the event for photos and autographs and hugs especially hugs which by the way are also totally optional we don't force the hugs on anyone but um uh, you can meet us after the event and if you're a vip ticket holder then you get to jump the line line jumping is a sport for you you can uh, you jump to the front of the line if you have uh the vip ticket so you get best seats in the house all of our books and and the first First chance to do the meet and greet after the event which can be pretty long you know if like a place like the Wilbur Theater where there's over a thousand people there uh, the meet and greets last a, a, a long time afterward and that's okay because we have to dish out a hug for everyone we don't have time to have conversations after after the event with a thousand people that that wouldn't work out just mathematically and because this is a mathematics podcast we uh, we don't have time I've done the math. We don't have time to, to meet every single person, have a full on conversation, but we still like to meet everyone afterward, give them a hug, have a quick hello and uh, move on with the evening. So that's what the, the VIP tickets will get folks from Minneapolis. We're headed to California after that Los Angeles, which does have more tickets now. For those of you who said it was sold out, uh, they opened up some more seating. It's the only venue on the entire tour where they're going to, going to do that. So uh, otherwise get your tickets while you can. We'll also be in uh, San Diego, Uh, That's actually before Los Angeles, then San Francisco, then Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. And oh, by the way, next week, we are announcing 22 more cities for the rest of the year, basically, the second leg of the Less Is Now Tour. And we're going to announce that first for our Patreon supporters because I got this idea from Sam Harris. His Patreon supporters, they get first access to the best seats in the house for his podcast tour, which he's starting recently or he's starting really soon. And so I thought it was a good idea for the people who are supporting us. They're part of that one percent. They get the first access to get the best seats in the house. So if you're a Patreon supporter, as long as you're a Patreon supporter by this weekend, then you will get an email with the first uh, presale access Uh, so that you can snatch up the best seats in the house for those 22 other cities all throughout North America. And then we hope to get to overseas next year as well. Uh, I know we'll do, we'll do added value after the podcast, Ryan, do you have anything else you want to talk about in this little intro? No, because this literal intro is becoming a bigger intro than I expected. (laughs) Let's get onto the podcast. We hope you enjoy this Boston event, ladies and gentlemen, and stay tuned after the show for our added value segment and also some comments and tips from our listeners. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. And, and we are here with about a thousand friends in Boston. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus. <laughs> and together we are the minimalists. Yeah, and- <laughs> <laughs> so we have some questions, and Ryan and I hope to have an answer for you. So feel free to step on up, give us your name, and we'll, uh, we'll start talking. Hi, I'm Chris. Chris. I am the leader of the Boston Minimalist Group with Cheryl over here. Nice. Nice. In line. And if you are in the Boston Minimalist Group, can you stand up so we can all see who you are? And if you would like to be in the Boston Minimalist Group, please come out. We have monthly meetups. Our next meetup is going to be May 7th at 2.30 at Pete's Coffee, or if it's nice out. 
um, across the street at the Boston Greenway. And for those, for those of you who don't know what a minimalist meetup group is, back in 2014, Ryan and I hit the road. We did 100 cities in 10 months. We basically donated a year of our lives and, and decided to leave behind in each city a meetup group because and we, we don't have any control over it. We just, we want, we wanted to leave something behind because what would happen is we would go to a city and people would come up to us afterwards and say, that's great, you were here for an hour or whatever, but now you're leaving. How do I connect with people locally? And I would say, I don't know. I, okay, Cupid? <laughs> um, is that still a thing? Okay. Um, that was a bad answer. And so it turns out we, we, we didn't have a good answer, so we went out and, and tried to make a good answer. It's called minimalist.org. You can go there, just click on the Boston group, and it's a Facebook group, and, and people meet uh, one, at least once a month. Sometimes groups will meet even more frequently than that, and then you'll get to surround yourself with either like-minded people or at least open-minded people who are willing to be supportive of whatever changes you want to make in your life. And it's not just about decluttering, by the way. I'm sure you can attest to that. It has to do with finances or career or anything else that you're looking for other people uh, that you, you need to support them or you, you, want to, uh, you want their support as well. Thank you so much. There's also a Providence group. I don't know where she is, but so you guys know, you can look up in Providence too if you're out that way. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Hi, Josh, Ryan. Howdy. Hello. Boston. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my question is actually for the audience. I was wondering how many people here think that experiences are more important than things. <laughs> yeah. All right. You're in good company. Yeah. I love it. Great. Awesome. Hey, how's it going? Howdy. My name is Jenny, um, and I have a question for you guys about saving money. So I know that you both listen, or I know that at least Ryan does listen to Joe Rogan's podcast, and I think you mentioned Sam Harris once as well. Yeah. So there's a guy who was on both of those, um, William McAskill. Um, Will McCaskill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he, his philosophy is anything over like 35000 or $40,000 that he makes, he donates. Mm. And so I would just kind of want to hear your opinion on what you like to save after whatever you need to live. To sure. still live your meaningful life and yeah. whatever, however you feel about that. For sure. So she's talking about a guy named Will McCaskill who runs an organization called Effective Altruism. Who, who finds the most effective ways to, to contribute money because not all nonprofits or charitable organizations are created equal. In fact, many of, many of them don't do much good at all while others do immense good in the world. And, and, it's, a, and it's hard for us to, as regular civilians to sort of discern how, you know, if I want to give you know, a hundred dollars, a dollar, a thousand dollars, whatever it may be, how do I know the most effective way to do that? And for those of you who are looking for a place to go, there's a great website called givewell.org, and it, they rank the top seven most effective charities in the world, and that list will change occasionally, but they use you know, algorithms basically to figure this out, and, and, and the way they do that is how many lives they are saving. Now, obviously, saving lives isn't the only good that we can do with our money, but it seems like the best good that we can do with our money. And I, I do think that contribution is important for at least two reasons. First off, it's important because if we, if we give, we grow. And the more we grow, the more we have to give. And it becomes this yeah. beautiful cycle. And I can tell you, throughout my solipsistic 20s, I was very much about me, 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 me. Yeah, I'm, I still think a lot about myself. It's hard not to, right? right? Everything that is happening to me is happening to me, right? And so whether it's like I'm sitting in front of my computer or drinking my coffee or eating my meal, it, everything happens to me. But when we can break outside of that and figure out that you know, there is a world out there and giving is living, and I know that it, it almost sounds like a platitude, but it, it's the absolute truth. And what Ryan and I have found, and we've had the capacity to, to give a lot more over the last six years, uh, even, even when I first walked away from the corporate world, I was 
I was contributing very little to my community. And I didn't have any money when I first walked away from the corporate world. I went from making $200,000 a year, which in Dayton, Ohio is probably, I don't know, half a million here. Um, it's Dayton, Ohio. Remember, Ryan was aspiring to make $50,000 a year. <laughs> and so uh, when we walked away, I made $23,000 that first year. And I contributed more that year than I had the, the past decade. Not monetarily, because I couldn't necessarily afford it. I still, I still did a few things monetarily when I could, but I started contributing time. So there was a soup kitchen about two miles away from my house where I lived. Uh, Habitat for Humanity, I helped build several houses with that. Almost electrocuted myself one time. Um, <laughs> so I don't work with wires anymore. But, and then beyond that, I found that I could also encourage other people to contribute as well. So over the last few years, in 2015, we made it a mission to contribute as much as possible. So Ryan and I, we, along with the help of a lot of our readers, we built an entire school in Laos. It was an elementary school for 66 kids who had this shack, essentially, that was just falling down on them. And, and yeah, thanks. Hey. You should have seen this shack. It was like... It was two classrooms in this shack, and they had like a three-foot wall dividing them. So like the teachers literally would have to like talk over each other when they uh, when they would teach. And then when it rained, I mean, the, the if they had a roof, then it, the rain was coming in from other places, and they would have to cancel school. And uh, yeah, it was it was just uh, unbelievable. Like the, the to be able to go over there and. Um, yeah, just like give them like a really awesome upgrade. And I, I got to tell you, when, when uh, you're welcome. Oh, no, thank, I, you. thank you for coming. <laughs> but, no, you know, I, I remember uh, when we were um, like at the party where they were like, uh, you know, basically thanking us. I, I uh, partnered with a nonprofit uh, coffee uh, roaster slash cafe that was over there called Jai Coffee House. And they were thanking us. And it was, it was really funny because, um, and of course I'm getting this through translation. I, I didn't practice on, on my, uh, uh, my Lao, <laughs> Lao language. But, but anyway, um, I, uh, I remember the guy saying, you know, um, thank you so much to Ryan and Tyson. He's the guy that owns, uh, runs Jai Coffee House. Thank you so much for coming out here and bringing your American money. And your money is so important to us. And you Americans are great. I mean, they were just, you know, really trying to, trying to talk, us, talk us up and make us feel good. But uh, when I got to address um, the, the, the group, and again, like it was going back through translation, uh, you know, I'm like trying to make jokes and like they're just not, <laughs> they're not landing, <laughs> um, which was fine. But I got to a point where I'm like, you know, the money, that, is, that was the easy part. Like it was, it, that was, uh, Tyson and I got together and uh, we decided to do this project, and, and, and Josh and I have a great group of, uh, of, of readers who wanted to contribute, and that was the easy part. The hard part was for this community to come together and actually build this school, because literally, like everyone there, I mean, they were family, friends, they all knew each other, I mean, they're, they're these little villages, and I was like, in America, this is what we're lacking. We are lacking this type of community. And like that, I saw everyone's head going, yeah, you do. <laughs> Thank you. But what yeah. else did we do that year? We, well, did, we did a ton of stuff. Yeah, and, and, and so, I mean, it kind of started with that, and then it snowballed from there. We, we did so well, and Ryan and I donated a good chunk of our own money to that, but that really helped it snowball, and, and all these other people started contributing, and we had some extra money, so we, we funded a high school for a year in, in Kenya, and um, we built three wells in Malawi, and, um, and then, of course, we wanted to do some stuff uh, back home the, the following year as well, and, and then the, that terrible Orlando shooting happened at the Pulse nightclub, the terrorist attack there, and, and like 50 people were killed, but 52 people were injured as well, and so there were still people who were alive but needed help, right? They had hospital bills, or they were still in the hospital, some of them, and so we did an event in Orlando and just donated 
uh, 100% of the proceeds from that. In fact, this event filled up really quickly, and so what we decided to do with all of the, the pre-sale tickets, which is well over half of the people here, um, we're using that money from, from this particular event to, to build an orphanage, orphanage on the U.S.-Mexico border. And... Oh, thanks. And I'm really inspired by people like Will McCaskill. He, he lives off of uh, $36,000 a year, or the, the, you know, the British equivalent of that, and uh, he'll adjust it for infl inflation uh, accordingly. But um, you know, if, if any of you get a chance to listen, he did a couple great interviews, uh, one with Joe Rogan, but the one with Sam Harris was, was phenomenal. And uh, Sam does something great now that after he interviewed him, he takes, uh, I think, the first $3,500 he makes every month uh, and uh, automatically donates that to, to GiveWell.org. GiveWell.org is the place that I, I tend to give most of my money if I'm just making a financial contribution. Yeah. Thanks for your question. That's a great Thank question. You. Thanks. Hi there. Uh, my name is Gabe. I actually came to your event when you screened the documentary last year. I remember and, you, Gabe. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys gave me some really good advice last year about drudging through the drudgery. It was... Uh, spring of my junior year, you know, I was really feeling the crunch, and um, I'm really happy to say that I took your advice to heart, and I'm now going to college at my dream school to study design, which I'm super passionate about, and so awesome, it's really man. awesome. Congratulations, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Holy moly. That is beautiful. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, and so, coming from that, you know, college is a, is a big transition from high school. And so I was wondering what advice you guys have for people on how minimalism can help with large transitions in your life, whether that be moving or starting a new job or going to a new school or anything like that. Yeah, you wanna start? Sure. <laughs> no, no, I, I, think, I think that's a, a great point. I, I feel like right now, since you've already like built these principles into your life, that this is, this is not going to be too tough of a transition because you know that you have to go into this very deliberately. And you know that you've got to, if this is your dream school and if this is your, uh, you, that uh, you're going for the job that you've always really wanted to do, like you've got to continue drudging through the drudgery. And I think, you know, minimalism, what it does, it's not that like it makes, it doesn't make the transition easy. I mean, in my talk, I said, look, I'm not talking about a perfect life or an easy life. Because simple ain't easy. Like, unfortunately, a lot of the times we confuse simple with easy, and, and that is not the case. In fact, it's easy to just go with the flow. It's easy to just go with your impulses. It is hard to go to, um, I don't know what school you're going to. I'm going to assume Harvard. No, I, what, what is it? Oh, I'm so Carnegie sorry. Valley. It's right there in his shirt. <laughs> I miss a lot of cues sometimes. Um, but anyway, no, I, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying that now, like you have these principles built in your life, you know what to do. And it, again, it's not gonna be easy, but at least you know how to approach it. And I think the same thing happens for when you get out of school. You know exactly that you're, what, what kind of job you want to go for. You know the effort you're gonna have to put into it. And you're gonna work really hard, man. Uh, the, the, the degree you're going for, is it four or six years? Uh, I think it's four years. Four design, years, yeah. So you're going to work really hard the next four years, and then you're probably going to work really hard another four years after that trying to pay off your debt. But that's what you know what to do. Like, you get out of... You get... <laughs> well, see, he's not going to spend 30 years because... <laughs> you cannot Bogart this guy's question. I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway... Um, <laughs> So, so all I'm saying is, is like now, you know, when you get out of college, it's not, how do I get into more debt? How do I go get a mortgage? How do I get a new car? I, oh my God, I just got this job. I'm making 80 grand a year. What debt payments can I afford? Like now you know exactly where to focus and what to do. So I, I would say, yeah, man, like you've got the habits built. Like you're going to, Gabe, you're going to do great, man. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I'll give you, I'll give you two, th two quick things. First off, I'm really happy for you. Uh, and I just want to say this, though. Happiness isn't the point. And so keep that in mind. There will be times where it doesn't feel happy. And you're, you, you're studying late for a test, and you're sacrificing something else. You're compromising on something else you want to do so you can do something that you should do. Because what you've done is you've aligned your actions 
with your values. And so you won't always feel happy, but that's not the point. Living a more meaningful life is the point. And I think happiness ends up being a beautiful, longer lasting byproduct of that. But you're not going to feel perpetually manic just because you, you're going to your, your, your uh, dream school. Uh, and one, one question for you. Do, are, you, are you getting into debt for this? Um, I actually am very fortunate, and my parents are going to be paying for my education. Okay. But um, the, the way we've sort of come to an agreement, which is I take out the minimum federal loan um, uh -huh. for school so that I have some invest in, investment in my own education. And I listen to your podcast on debt, and you know, despite that, I actually think it's a pretty reasonable idea. And um, I really do like the idea of investing in my own education. And when I come out of it, um, I know that they have great job placement programs. So I'm confident that this will not lead me somewhere where I'm, you know, saddled with 20 something thousand dollars of debt. And I'm looking at it and like, what the hell do I do about this? Yeah. So um, I, am, I am in an incredibly fortunate position. And so I definitely want to, uh, you know, focus my efforts on maybe making my, getting myself out of debt isn't going to be my number one priority, but maybe that's going to be, you know, donating the money that I'm making towards a charity like Will McCaskill's at GiveWell or something yeah. like that. So, yeah. Beautiful. That's awesome, man. Good right, luck, thank Ed. you so much. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just echo. So for most of you know my thoughts on debt. Um, there's no such thing as good debt. And, and, there are many debts that are far worse than others, right? I mean, if you go to get a, a advanced payday loan, um, those have upwards of 3,500% interest rates. Uh, <laughs> someone owns a payday loan store back there that's wooing. Um, yeah, and, and there, are other, there, are other, there are other ones that are more responsible, but I, and if I'm in your shoes, I'm doing whatever I can to A, avoid any debt whatsoever, or B, if I do get into any debt, pay it off as, as quickly as I can and, so that I can feel that financial freedom because debt is a huge anchor and often prevents us from, from living the life we want to live and going in the direction we want to go. Howdy. Hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Lori, and... I have a lot of debt, <laughs> but that wasn't my question. It's just interesting to me. <laughs> um, so I am, though, on that same line, getting back to work after having two kids who are two and six right now. So um, I work as a life coach, as an artist, as a writer. Um, so I am wondering about reconciling the idea of I know you guys are writers, but also writing physical books, and then also as an artist, making things that add to the stuff in the world. Um, so I'm kind of a non-practicing artist at the moment because of that conundrum. Yeah, so, so we are minimalists, not deprivationists. Um, there's actually a, t a term for that. They're called ascetics, right? The, and you can go back several thousand years, and well, you can even there are ascetics today. But ascetics believe in, in perpetually depriving themselves and suffering so much that they can eliminate pain through pain, which I, I haven't worked out the math on yet. But um, <laughs> my my point being is. As I said in, in my talk earlier, consumption isn't the problem. The, the problem that we, the, the stuff isn't even the problem. We are the problem. And, 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 and us being willing to, to let go of the notion that we need what we're supposed to have allow, makes room for what we need what we want, what we like, the things that add value to our lives, and all the excess stuff is just that. It's excess. Are you guys taking a drink every time we say add value? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank That's you. A good question. Let's do, uh, you want to do one more long, long form and then we'll move into the lightning round. Because we got, we got a, a lot of questions. So, so we have, we, we have, over a thousand people here and we certainly can't answer questions when we're doing the hug line so we'll, we'll try to rapid fire through the, the lightning round. Let's do one more in depth. Okay. Howdy. Hi. 
I don't know if this is going to be long form or lightning round, but you guys can tell me. Uh, my name is Sandy. I am uh, a yogi. Uh, I'm a yoga teacher and dietitian as well. Um, I live in, I don't know, about a 325, 350 square foot apartment. I have a one in, one out rule. Uh, my friends very affectionately call it my dollhouse. Um, <laughs> But I, I really appreciate uh, bringing intention to how I spend my time and also what I, what I have, my objects. Um, and I think that that gives a really important platform for living authentically, which is my greatest value. Uh, but there's times that I struggle. And I think my, my question for you guys is whether it was yesterday or whether it was six years ago, what is something that stands out in your mind that was a moment where you struggled with a decision either to purchase it or to let it go? Well, let me ask you this first. What, what do you struggle with? <laughs> is this the lightning round or the long <laughs> answer? <laughs> No, I want to be able to answer your question better, honestly. I mean, is there something, because here, here's the honest truth. Everyone here, including myself, uh, we, we're all struggling with something. And we all have these struggles that we stumble upon. And, and I, I think the best parts of me are made up of my past struggles. And, and so, and then, of course, the best parts of my future self will be made up of what I'm struggling with now. Because as I struggle through those things, I'm able to grow. And so, so yeah, I, I can definitely talk about my struggles and Ryan can talk about his, but is, is there something that really stands out? Do you want me to share first? Well, so, so, no, so go. I guess, I guess to clarify, I'm talking about objects, but, but I very much, I, I guess that's why I'm asking, because I do believe that there's growth that comes from those struggles um, and, and that evaluation process. Um, but, it, but I guess I'm asking about, about objects, whether it was a purchase, whether or not you purchased something, or whether or not, or whether it was getting rid of something from, from your possessions. Yeah, I, I think the, the objects, I, and I, I totally understand what you're saying, but I think I, I don't delineate the objects for me because I think the, the material possessions are a physical manifestation of what's going on inside of me. And so when I had you know, the 300,000 things in my, my house, a very ordinal system of alphabetized DVDs and, and uh, CDs and bins and boxes, it was really just because like, I wasn't dealing with what was going on in, inside me. And so that was like my biggest struggle was, was pretending it wasn't there. Yeah, I'll tell you, um, the biggest, and I, I actually had the struggle pretty much any time I'm in my uh, tour bus, you know, the, the 2004 Toyota Corolla that's in the documentary. <laughs> and every time it rains, it leaks. And someone sent me an email, like, God love them. They're like, you need to just, there's, because it has like a sunroof, and it's like, you need to get the track cleaned around it, and it'll, it'll you know, you'll be fine. And that is exactly what's going on, except uh, I brought it to the mechanic to fix it, and he was like, dude, it is clogged. <laughs> like, he's like, I can't, I can't fix it. Um, he, well, he said he could, but then, like, it, it would just cost more than what the car's worth. <laughs> so, <laughs> every time it rains, like, I feel that, like, water dripping on my head. <laughs> and I'll make, like, a corner, and then, like, the water starts dripping on Mariah's head. <laughs> and then, like, we're grabbing tissues and, like, trying to, like, hold, <laughs> hold up the holes. And we're looking at each other, like, we should get it, we should just get another car. And, but very quickly, I'm like, you know, this water dripping on my head is not nearly as bad as that debt payment I would have to take on. And so really, uh, I mean, I, I do struggle with stuff. Um, you, don't deprive yourself. That, I guess that's what I would tell you when it comes to the objects. It, you know, I, got, I have a stein, beer stein, that my grandmother gave me when I was in high school. And I use it for, like, putting all my loose change in. But that stein is, means a lot to me. Like, it, it is very sentimental. My grandmother is, uh, she's not doing really well. Um, and I'm just like, now it's hitting me. I'm like, oh, man, like... You know, I, I just got to spend as much time as I can with her at this point. And I, I probably won't ever let go of that Stein. Like, I will probably always hold on to that. And uh, I would never just get rid of something because I'm like, well, I'm a minimalist. I can't, I can't hold on to this Stein. Now, if I went home 
and it spontaneously combusts that, I would be like, damn it, I really like that sign. <laughs> but I do know that the memory in that, you know, isn't in that stein, it's, it, it, it is inside of me. Um, but again, I would never just get rid of it just for the sake of, well, I'm a minimalist and I'm gonna get rid of that stein. So don't deprive yourself. Your turn. <laughs> I still got one for you. So you, you, you go first and then I'll go. Uh, Ryan, I, I love that you chose to, um, have the benefit of, of being closer to the earth with your, with your water dripping on your head. That's how I'm gonna reframe that for That's, you. I'm gonna hold that thought, that's good. <laughs> that is good. Uh, my mom's vintage Levi's shirt. Mm. Yeah. Do you wear it? Yes. Yeah, keep it. <laughs> you yeah. have our permission. <laughs> but really you don't need our permission though. You need your permission. And if it's, yeah. it's, if it's making you feel that bad to let it go, I mean, if it's, if it's one shirt, then yeah, hold on to it. I mean, if you were like, I have, you know, hordes and hordes and hordes of my mother's old newspapers and clippings, and, <laughs> and then I would be like, it would, we'd have a completely different conversation. Actually, I'd probably get one of the professional organizers to help you out, because they know the best way to organize is to get rid of most of your stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a denim t-shirt, like, there is a point where, yeah, you don't want to just throw something away just for the sake of it. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound to me like you have, have a huge hoarding problem. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing that, that I, would, but I, I would always ask, when there's something like that that's bothering you, like, so for whatever reason it may be bothering you, the, the other question I might have is how could you, in what other ways could you use it? Yeah, you know, I've seen people take old shirts like that and have it framed and turn it into artwork where it's like it's my mom's old uh, vintage Levi's shirt and I'm no longer wearing it or it's not the best thing for me to wear anymore uh, because, you know, it doesn't fit me just right or, or, or whatever. And you can actually turn it into a piece of art. Uh, I've seen people do that with photographs as well where they're like, here's a bunch of photos I didn't want to scan because they're kind of silly, but it, there are places who where artists will take those and they'll turn them into collages. And so, you know, you can do something else. You, 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 can, you can repurpose the, those things. Uh, for me, my, my, uh, my struggle is, is, in a weird way, a struggle by proxy. And, and what I mean by that is I, you know, so my life is, I'm 35 now, and it's, my life is considerably different from what it was when I was 28, when I first embraced minimalism. I have a partner, we live together, and we have a three-year-old daughter, and she likes different stuff from what I do, right? <laughs> and so I'm constantly looking at other people's stuff, even though we're a minimalist household. All three of us are minimalists. Ella can't pronounce it yet, but she tries. <laughs> she says minimalalalalist. <laughs> and, um, and actually, by the way, it's, it's, it's great when the first time she asked me, like, what is minimalism? And, and, you know, I have my, my little, you know, stock answer. Minimalism's a thing that gets us past the things that, so we can make room for life's most important things, which actually aren't things at all. And then I'm trying to explain what a homonym is to her, so... <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's nice because I find that, that dealing with other people's stuff helps me appreciate their needs as well and realize you know it's not just about me it's about we and i don't just want to tolerate this person's stuff whether it's my close family or friends but anyone i want to go beyond that i want to respect the person who they are and appreciate them for who they are warts and all because i want people to appreciate me as well thanks for your question Thank you. good question all right, well, for, for the people who are listening at home, if you have a comment or tip for anyone to, that asked a question today, you can give us a call at 406-219-7839. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on the next episode. Also, uh, if you, you can now take your phone out and actually just record a, a voice memo and send that to podcast at theminimalists.com. That'll end up going to, to podcast Sean. 
By the way, can we get a round of applause for podcast, Sean? Yeah. We love you, Sean. There's no one back there. <laughs> Just kidding, man. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll air those tips and tricks from our callers on the next episode. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our hashtag Ask the Minimalist Lightning Round. <laughs> yes, indeed. We, uh, we, we do our best here to answer each question with a, a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. Usually we get these questions from Instagram or, or Twitter or Facebook, but we're here today. So what Ryan and I have been doing while we're on the road is, is competing. And um, what we try to do is we compete to give the pithiest answer and you all get to be the judge. So, and, and by the way, if, if we don't have a pithy answer, sometimes we'll ramble a bit. Yeah, we'll just disqualify ourselves and ramble. Howdy, what's your name? Hi, Marianne. Um, so this is my first minimalist uh, event my friend brought me. She's over there. Um, so this is a perfect event for me right now because I'm in a transition, I'm moving, um, I'm looking for my next position, career, job, and I work in education and I have a champagne taste on a bare budget. And uh, somehow through my 20s, I'm your age, 1981, um, through my 20s, I racked up a lot of debt, credit card debt, and I'm trying to change my ways. So my question to you, growing up, family members, big into Christmas, birthdays, presents, material items, all that jazz, is it, is it possible at my age? Um, and then also, um, how do you kind of like get your family on board and your friends when they've known you to be a shopaholic or going to this or doing that? Hmm. Can, you, can you answer that 140 characters, Mr. Nicodemus? <laughs> but she has two questions. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I would say the people in your life who love and appreciate you, they will support you no matter what. Remember those Jeff Foxworthy jokes? You might be a redneck. Remember those, right? Like that was you an actual a, thing. Yeah. You might be a minimalist. And you, you know, <laughs> oh, that is still your... So how about this? <laughs> how about this? You might be broke if you have a car payment, you have a credit card payment, you have a credit card. You have a student loan payment. You have a 30-year mortgage. Period. Now, I... I Disqualified. Uh, that's, that's totally... Sean, can you, give us a, can you give us a character? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Thank I you. I was not disqualified, you but are you got much better applause than I did. So, this is why you're my best friend. So, so I, I will give you a, a much longer answer. So I, you haven't listened to our podcast yet. And I'm going to encourage you to go back and listen to two episodes of it. Episode number 60 is an entire two-hour-long excursion on finances, okay? And there's a, a, a long time ago, a year ago, uh, we recorded a podcast on money. It's episode number 12. And both of those dive pretty deep. And once you've listened to those, we also have a couple essays on our website. The one that sticks out in my mind right away, it is, it's called Financial Freedom. Five Difficult Steps to Get Out of Debt. And that's the most honest title I could give because it is difficult to get out of debt, but it is so, so worth it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Right. Thank you. Hi. Howdy. Um, I hope this isn't redundant. My name's Tessa. Um, so my dad... That's not redundant. Oh, right. <laughs> Who's got a um, light on back there? I'm sorry, that is really distracting. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my dad passed away last summer, um, and we, my brother and I, my mom's not really involved, so we have the dreaded storage locker. Um, and I have a box in my apartment 
So my brother lives in an apartment in New York. I live in Boston. So we just don't have a place for this stuff. So I guess my question is, like, I'll get rid of my stuff fine, but I have, I cannot, like, get rid of my dad's stuff. And I'm, like, waiting for the moment that Josh had. Um, I feel really guilty. Like, I just can't do it. So I don't know if there's a helpful, like, words for that. And then also, like, what about the family legacy stuff? Like, the furniture that, like, I know my dad would want us to have. Like, do we keep the storage locker till we buy a house? Like, what do we do? Also, my dad would love you guys, so. He didn't have a lot of stuff, but we still have the storage locker. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> it's a toughie, I know. Yeah, well, it's especially tough getting it into a tweet. Um, <laughs> I've never, let go, I've never regretted anything I've let go of, but if I ever do, I'll let go of the regret. That's good. That's good. Mm. I can't beat that. Man, um... Hmm... I, I can't beat that. What, here's my pithy answer, but that, it, won't, it won't beat. That was good, man. <laughs> uh, what, what I would say is, if you don't ever start, you're going to be waiting the rest of your life. And um, I take it you haven't read our book, Everything That Remains? Um, no, I'm an avid yeah. podcast listener, but okay. not books yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. I'd love to Do give you, you a copy. I, I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm selling you a copy of our book, uh, which are, by the way, are available in out in the lobby. <laughs> but uh, uh, let, let, to be honest, that a hundred percent of the profits go to to our, our our favorite charity. It's the the ga the Josh and Ryan Gas Fund to get to Portland, Maine tomorrow. Um. No, um, I, 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 seriously. Uh, for, honestly, though, afterward, if you come out and you want a book and you can't afford one, let us buy you one. I'd be, be more than happy to, to buy you a book. Um, or if you just forgot your wallet or something. Um, but for asking that question, I think you'll find a lot of value in everything that remains. It's a five-year story for about me and Ryan. We, 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 we made this transition from well-organized hoarders to minimalists, you know, these corporate guys. And, and the second chapter in there will especially resonate with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll try to be more pithy. <laughs> try to get through as many as we can here. All right. Hi. Howdy. Uh, my name is France. Um, I'm having some difficulty framing this question, but I think it's a quick one. Um, and I feel like I have to have a disclaimer <laughs> before I ask it. Uh, you know, number one, I, I gen always support a very strong social safety net. I think as Americans, we have a responsibility to protect the, the very vulnerable. Um, one thing I picked up on when you were telling your story is you both came from similar childhoods where you lived on government assistance and your parents struggled with alcohol and drugs. And I was wondering how you were able to overcome adversity to first kind of ride that first wave of success where you were financially and professionally very successful, but then you're on the second wave of success where you are able to adopt this philosophy of minimalism. And so I was wondering what makes you different from other people that are struggling? How did you get to that headspace to accept this? Because if you think stereotypically, people that are disadvantaged, um, they don't get there. And so I was wondering, did you have a mentor? Did you read something early on that put you on this path? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I get to start this one. Go for it. Uh, if you want to make money, actually, let me, can I start this over? Yes. S start the track over. Delete. Delete. <clears throat> uh, if you want to be rich, go get a sales job, but you're going to fucking hate it. <laughs> Hmm. 
That was my answer. Uh, no, uh, Sean, can I get some time on the clock? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, mm, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's helpful. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> there are two reasons we make changes. Fear and meaning. And I feared staying in my previous life more than I feared making the change. Yeah, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to be disqualified on that. <laughs> I think that was a tie on that one. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll, I'll just, real quick, um, th that, that is the, hon the honest truth that I, I was very narrowly successful in, in the corporate world, and, and that was not real success, right? The, the real success is, is pursuing a life that, is, that, that aligns with your values, and that was not the life I was living, and, and now I am. And it's an imperfect life, but it's so much better. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Howdy. Hi. Uh, hi, Joshua and Ryan. My name is Ashley. I'm an avid podcast listener. Your documentary and podcast have truly made an impact on our family's life. Have it, some of you seen our documentary? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, there is pretty much one person you can thank for that, and he's right back here, the Italian stallion, Matt Diavella. Seriously, this guy, I can't wait until like, he's going to be this awesome like, documentary. I, I just know he's going to be an awesome documentary. And I'll be like, you know, Matt Vell, he did our first movie. It, we were his first movie. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and we also have Conrad back here who's helping us film. So let's give him a round of applause as well. Thank you for being here, yeah. brother. Thanks, Conrad. We, we have no idea what we're filming, by the way. We're just kind of filming and seeing what happens because it worked out really well last time we did that. And so we figured, why not try that again? So we're out here listening once again, and I will continue listening. Thank you. So you've made such an impact that uh, there are many places in our home that now echo. <laughs> <laughs> that is the sound <laughs> of minimalism. <laughs> In your most recent podcast, you spoke about how clothing seasons have evolved over the past several decades. We've gone from two seasons to four seasons to 52 seasons to what's on trend. As a parent, as parents, we've adopted the two seasons of clothing within our children's wardrobe. I know that you've discussed Project 333, but as a parent, I buy and plan my children's wardrobes in advance so that I can purchase things when they're on sale or a friend has something that's used. I'm very analytical in nature. Can you help parents quantify the items necessary for a child's two-season wardrobe? For example, five dresses for a girl, two pairs of pants, five pairs of pants, long sleeves. What does Ella's wardrobe look like? How am I supposed to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I got, you gotta go first though. I'll find, I'll figure out one. Okay, my, my, my short answer here, okay. What does Ella's wardrobe look like? Um, lots of stripes, but that's not my answer. Uh, <laughs> it's not my choice. Here, here we go, here we go, because you mentioned sale price, right? Um, so uh, for most of us, let me, let, me, let me get it tweetable here. Uh, Sale price, no, full price is often the intentional price because sale price is full price. 
I'm going to, sp actually, I can't preface it. If I preface it, that's kind of cheating, I think. Uh, what I'll say is, you and your husband get to set boundaries. You don't need anybody's permission to do anything but yours. Mm. Nice. Are we tied at this point? I think we need a tiebreaker at least, right? Yeah, dude. I, I don't really keep score on this. I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> well, well, we'll treat this. Well, actually, you know what? We'll do two more. And then uh, we'll, if we still need a tiebreaker after that, then we'll, we'll keep going. But I know they'll, they'll kick us out of here pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. So, howdy. Hi. Uh, Randy from Hopetail. Look at these balcony seats. These are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so about a year ago, I adopted uh, the minimalist philosophy and uh, kind of got me down a path thinking about what adds value in my life. And uh, material goods is kind of one thing, but um, I kind of like to know your guys' opinion on relationships and how you assess value in relationships. Okay, I'll use this one because... I think I know I've like used this before, so I'm totally pulling out my old material here. That's all right. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter whose blood someone has in their veins. I invest in people who invest in me. Mm. Yeah. Well, since we're pulling out old material. You can't change the people around you. But you can change the people around you. What do you think? <laughs> that was totally me. Ah! That's all right, we got one more. All right. We got, we got one more, you can tie it up here. All right. Hi, my name's Leanne. Hey, Leanne. Um, I don't know if this is a question for you guys or for like a life coach, but you downsize. I'm definitely not a life coach. <laughs> I have more life experience than many life coaches. Um, oh, I'm I not just... bashing on life coaches. Many of them are great. It's just a joke. It's a play on words. <laughs> no, but they really do have more uh, education than us, though, for yeah, sure. That's definitely true. <laughs> like, so sorry. I guess I'm just looking for some direction. You downsize, you minimize, you lower or get out of your debt. Now what? What do you look for? Mm. You know, I don't know what I'm looking for in life. Mm. <laughs> you want me to go? Yeah, go. Yeah, you gotta go. Okay, okay. So, so if I were to just re rephrase your question, it sounds to me like you're saying, once the stuff is out of the way, then what? Right? Okay. Yeah, like how do you find the value? Like what's value and meaning to you? Yeah. So, in order to live a meaningful life, you must align your short-term actions with your long-term values. They held back their applause for me because they want this to keep going. <laughs> it doesn't... Wait, no, damn it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> no. That's a good one. I kind of wanted to keep going, too. No, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what he said in a second. But no, there, there is one. I got I to gotta put, put this in tweet size form. Um, if you aren't clear on what your values and beliefs are, you're going to be lost the rest of your life. <laughs> now, Josh's, what he just whispered was much better than that. Uh, you are what you desire. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here comes the tiebreaker. 
Hi, Ryan. Hi, Josh. Howdy. Hello. My name's Han. We're up in San Diego, California. Nice. Oh, wow. That's a bit of a, bit of a drive. A I've, bit. I've made that drive before. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. In 2014, we water literally... coming on my head all, the whole time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we went from Missoula to Florida to, like, L.A., to basically coast to coast to coast to coast. It was, it was unbelievable. Did anyway. You, do you guys fly? Sorry, enough about I... me. More about your question. Okay, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah good idea. Um, so I've watched your documentary like five, six times, mm. so I'm a practicing minimalist. But in terms of my parents, they're just not on board, and you know, they're like 50-something years old now, and how do you, sorry, 55. I know, I should know my parents' age, right? <laughs> That's not what they're laughing at. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Anyways, um... It's okay. They've been laughing at me all night. It's, <laughs> you'll get used to it. Okay. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, how do I get them on board? And, you know, it's tough because they're set in their ways. And uh -huh. it's just the older generation who's just... I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, they're probably going to hate me by the time. It's, not, it's chronologically true. Your parents are older than you. And a generation ahead. <laughs> I'm 27, by the way. But, yeah, what do you say to that, you know, age group and... Uh, okay, maybe I should just stop talking. Here you go. <laughs> no, you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. And, um... You got some? Yeah. You can't change the people around you. you. That, that's... Oh <laughs> 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 I kind of just want to, I kind of just want to pass and give it to you, man. This is a lot of fun. For some reason, I feel like it's easier to, <laughs> to just forfeit than. Mm. Uh... Well, hold on. You think for a sec. You think All right, for a you, sec. If you got one, go. All right. All right. People don't hate change. They hate being changed. I wish I would have thought of that one. <laughs> Bottom of the ninth. Yeah. Full count. All right, this is all I can come up with. Um, if you truly love your friends and family and want them to be happy, you will support them in their happiness. Thank you. Um, I, Are you gonna I, drop the mic? What's that? Are you gonna drop the mic? No, no, no. Drop the mic! I'm sorry, we can't get through the rest of them, but we, we I, I know, I know, oh. If you wait, uh, yeah. actually I don't wanna. No, yeah, after we're, we're not gonna have time for questions. <laughs> Uh, we're in about 15 minutes or tweet so. Tweet us. If you tweet us, we will tweet you back. I promise. I promise you'll get an answer on Twitter. Yes, That's the, always the best way to communicate so with us. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, but we, in about 15 or 20 minutes, we'll be out there. If anyone wants to stick around, we, we will dish out some hugs. We've got some books out there as well. Like I said, if you, if you can't uh, afford or you, or you just didn't bring your, your wallet with you, you're welcome to grab one up. We'll, we'll, we'll buy one for you. I want to thank the, uh, the Wober for having us here. Thank you yeah. so much. Amazing staff, amazing venue. Yeah, like, thank you so much. As always, if you leave here with one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things. Because the opposite never works. Thanks, y'all.
All right, y'all, it is time for our added value portion of the show. This is where Ryan and I talk about what's adding value to our lives recently. Ryan, what has been adding value to your life? I know you've been traveling like crazy, so you, you've had less of an opportunity to to take in some of the same creations that I've taken in recently, but uh, what have you been enjoying lately? Um, well, on the plane ride over to, oh no, it was a plane ride back from Tokyo. Uh, I watched Moonlight. Uh-huh. Dude. Yeah. I had no why I won Oscar. Yeah. Why I won Best Picture. Yeah. It was, dude, phenomenal, phenomenal movie. So good. God, I loved it. Great writing. Great. Just a great perspective. Mm. Um, Yeah. I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Moonlight is a great movie. I've also been watching this series on Netflix called Dear White People. Uh Uh-huh. The title is very subversive. Like, it makes you feel like it's a one-sided series. Uh Uh-huh. It is not one-sided. I haven't even heard of it. It does a beautiful job of... It shows basically like these different events that happen in this college. And it shows it through the different perspectives of black and white people. And it just does a great job of showing like, hey, here is why... Um, here, here is why white privilege is a problem. Mm -hmm. And then it's the other perspective of, Hey, white privilege isn't the only problem, right? It just does a really good job of balancing between these two, like black or white, you know, well, I I shouldn't say they're black or white. People like to make it black or white. Mm. No pun intended. Yeah. Um, but they like to make it binary is what you're saying. Yeah. They like to make it binary and it's not. And it just does a great job of showing both perspectives, good and bad, uh, and I, I just, I don't want to go into it too much because I don't want to ruin it, but Dear White People is great. Moonlight is great. I'm going to change my, my recommendation based on that. I'm, I'm reading a book right now. I'm not all the way through it, but uh, it follows in that same vein. It's uh, by Charlemagne. It's called, it just came out uh, last month in April. It's called Black Privilege. Opportunity, opportunity comes to those who, oh, what, <sighs> Black Privilege, opportunity comes to those who seek it, I think is is, is the subtitle of it. Is it as... Is it a, is it like a, because to me, like that type, just like dear white people sounds very subversive. Mm-hmm. Uh, black privilege sounds like a very, um, all lives matter type thing. No, it's the opposite of that. Okay. In, in, in fact, uh, I mean, he's a black man, obviously. And, and, and Charlemagne is a your famous radio host and a commentator, a TV show host. Okay. And what, what he's talking, he, as a black man, he recognizes there is something called the your white privilege. And he doesn't, uh, and that can be systemic, but he, he looks at, well, we all have our own type of privilege. And, mm-hmm. and for him, it's a, a privilege to, to be black. Or uh, I, was, I was listening to Chris Hardwick on uh, the Nerdist podcast recently talk about how people often tweet him about, hey, you need to check your privilege. And he looks at it and says, tweeted from iPhone. And it's like, well, you have iPhone privilege, right? right. And, and we all, the two billion of us that are on the internet have internet privilege. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a such thing as white privilege. There, there, there is, especially yeah. in, in the Western world or in America. America in particular, but we also have the opportunity to create our own, I'll have to check our, that our out, own privilege. But, so it is not like an all lives matter type thing. Cause that frustrates no, the hell out of me though. No, yeah. it's, it's, it's the opposite of that. It's yeah. I mean, he, he's a black man who's showing, look, there are systemic problems. We're not all necessarily created equal or, or come from an equal place. He grew up in a trailer park in Monk's corner, South Carolina, and didn't have much going for him. Got arrested very young and realized he needed to retake, regain control of his life. And now he's wildly successful, not just like monetarily successful or, or celebrity successful. That's not how he's measuring success, but he's living the life he wants to live. He's contributing awesome. way beyond himself. And that's because he recognized, I may not have white privilege, but I have some s- sort of privilege in my life. Let me take advantage of th- whatever situation I'm in. Let me make the best of it is really what he's saying. Yeah. And, and he, he writes about the seven different principles in his life that have changed his life and so each chapter is a different principle in his life yeah it's it's really good and then also uh, Bex and I just started watching the third season of Fargo it just came out oh I haven't started it yet it's uh, Ewan McGregor plays two different characters in it wow so good man so good can't wait oh I can't wait I forgot oh yes I I totally (laughs) forgot about that dude I can't wait to start that there's very few shows that I look forward to watching and Fargo is one of them three 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 at at, at this recording and they're so good I can't wait dude yeah oh Mar's gonna be so excited we just finished um uh actually i don't want to talk about the shows that we just finished because they're kind of lame i would not recommend them to other people there's shows that we started watching and got hooked on uh-huh 
but I would not recommend them. So See, I drop mind. out. Anyway. I drop out. And so I, I had a previous recommendation. I recommended The Americans, and it was a decent show, but I, I, I lost my interest you after the out. first season. <laughs> Bex kept going. The only reason we watch these two shows is because of the cliffhangers that they leave. Uh huh. And it's like, and they are like decently. No, they're not decently. Written, I, I learned actually. to walk away from a man. Like they're, it's com- just, they're comedy, so and they are like they make us laugh. That's really okay. what it comes yeah, down that's to. That's important. Yeah. Well, All and, right, and, I don't want. I don't want to drag this intro out too long. This isn't an intro. This is an outro, Ryan. Oh, I mean, I don't want to drag this outro out too long. <laughs> well, um, r- real quick. So, uh, added value. So I just recommended black privilege. Uh, and then I recommended Fargo season three. Oh yeah. Season three. It's so, you know, Bex is from Minnesota and Fargo, the whole thing takes place in Minnesota. Yeah, I don't know why they call it Fargo. I get, I get a whole new perspective watching this with her because her family, especially, especially certain people in her family and her friends have this little bit of the, the Minnesota accent. Yeah. And so you hear these, these Minnesota, Minnesotisms maybe. I, uh, anyway, it, you hear these little things in, in their vernacular that she says from time to time. And it's so cute. It's just like adorable. Like watching this, it gives me this whole other perspective. So, um, real quick movie. So if you have a girlfriend or boyfriend from Minnesota, you will have a new appreciation for their, uh, their, their vernacular. Yeah, I think so. And it just a, an appreciation for the way that they were raised. And like the, the third episode takes place in Los Angeles and it's this weird thing. Like it's this exaggerated version of Los Angeles. So it's like, Oh, we're all stuck in traffic. It must be Los Angeles. And, Sipping lattes in traffic. Right, yeah. That kind of thing. And, and then of course it's an exaggerated version of Minnesota too, because right. the accents aren't actually that thick. And, and really it was comparing the rural world, world, rural world, the real rural world. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I have trouble with L's man, rural world. And, uh, and then, and of course the city life as well so it sort of contrasted those two and i'm really enjoying it i enjoyed the first two seasons a lot i oh, would yeah, definitely yeah. recommend those uh, the first season was outstanding the second one i, I love the have, second one i might have liked the second one better although yeah. it's it's and it was rated really well it was, it was at least equal to the first one i it, felt like i it, agree yeah because it was there, and, and that's hard to do because the first one was so plots good. like they don't really no yeah like it's, it's they all have their own plots and they all have their own characters that you love or hate but you're invested in either way so this microphone's getting heavy yes so i'm going to move on real quick to right here right now i had one other recommendations but i'll save it for the next episode right here right now ryan and i are on the road right now we're headed to 40 cities this year the less is now tour find your city find your date find your theater where we're going to be over at lessisnow.com this has been so great so far and i know it's going to get even better from here uh, also, The Minimalist Podcast is often the number one health podcast on iTunes, and it occasionally charts in the top 10 of all shows. And this year, uh, we're going to build a new podcast and film studio. And, and the microphone in my, or the microphone, what is this, a stand, a boom mic? It's something. It's heavy, and I'm holding it because it fell off the table. Anyway, uh, we're building the new podcast and film studio. And since we refuse to clutter our podcast with advertisers, we need your help. So we created a, po- a Patreon page. What is Patreon, you ask? Patreon is a website that allows p- people who create stuff like the Minimalist Podcast to support their own or to build their own subscription service and allow our listeners to contribute on a per episode basis. Uh, We're asking our listeners to contribute two bucks per episode to help us build a studio so we can reach more folks with our simple living message. Uh, By the way, the minimalists typically publish, uh, we publish one episode a week, usually occasionally two, but Patreon allows you to set a monthly cap on your contribution. So if we start to publish a million episodes a month, you don't have to worry about that. Also, uh, if you want to support us, you can't afford to support us this month, the month of May, 2017, we're donating uh, $10 for every iTunes review we, we receive. So if you if you even if you give us a one star obviously we prefer a five star review because it makes us feel warm and fuzzy but that's actually not why we prefer it it gets our message in front of more people our podcast gets recommended to more people via their algorithm uh, so you can help us do that but you can also help save some lives here we're, we're donating all of the funds so far we have over 200 new reviews this month so we've raised over two thousand dollars or you've raised over two thousand dollars ryan and i are donating the money uh, to the against malaria foundation thirty five hundred dollars saves one life so if you want to help us save a life pause the podcast right now take 30 seconds leave us a review we will donate ten dollars in your name to the against malaria foundation this month ryan you got anything else no man all i have are some comments and tips from our listeners 
Hi, my name is Amanda and I'm a teacher in Revelstoke, BC, Canada. And this uh, answer is for Pam regarding what she should do with all of that paper that comes with being uh, a secondary school teacher. So I've been teaching since 2005 and since 2010, I've been using an online platform called Blogger to create daily posts on everything that I do in class, including all handouts, videos, um, just a total review of each daily schedule for every one of my classes. And this has been a massive help in so many different areas. So it saves me a ton of paper because all I need to do is each day what I do is take all of my handouts. I just take one of each and I go down to the office and I scan it through our um, photocopier there that also scans. It scans directly to my email. I then go back to my classroom grab the scans, pop those scans into either Dropbox or Google Docs and create a link and then embed those on my blog through Blogger. And it only takes me about 10 to 15 minutes now to do that every day for all of my classes. So to get a Blogger, it is free. You just need to have a Gmail in order to set it up. You can just go to blogger.com. And what's really wonderful is since 2010 to now, my school district, I would say about 80 to 90% of the teachers have blogs. And as I said, it helps a ton with just paper and having everything online. But when you have, say, the same class the following year, you can just go to your old blog, pull off stuff right from there so you don't have all that paper. But um, an added benefit that I've seen is that for both students and parents, there are so many advantages to having a teacher blog. So for students, when a student is away or um, they're sick or anything like that, when they come back to school, they know now um, that it's their responsibility to grab whatever they've missed from my blog and have it ready to hand in. So they, because they um, can just download everything and fill stuff out online from my blog, they don't need to come back and I don't need to find all the paper that they've missed and try and track it all down. Um, it's right there on the blog. And further for parents, I found the blog is super helpful because it, every single day I update it. So every single day, parents know exactly what their child's done in class, what handouts have been provided, what's for homework, what they've watched with regards to any video resources. So the parents um, I've found that have come to me have been so um, thankful for this because they really feel like they're tied into what their child is doing on a daily basis and they can refer back to my blog anytime they want to offer their child more assistance if they need it at home. I don't claim to be a minimalist, but I have to say you guys have absolutely inspired me to declutter and that's what I've been doing for the past year. I've also been trying to help out my 80 year old mother. Hey Ma, what's this? I don't know. When was the last time you used it? I don't know. Can I get rid of it? Sure. It's been working pretty well. Now she's going into a nursing home, and I never realized how much paperwork she had. Drawers and drawers filled with paperwork. It's statements, canceled checks, warranties, receipts for 20 years. And I can't find the deed to her house, so I have to go through all of it. So my tip is, watch out for the paperwork if you're helping somebody declutter. Hey Josh and Ryan, this is Ethan from Denver, Colorado. I just had a suggestion for your listeners of something that I've started doing that I found a lot of value in, and it's doing a five, uh, five minute meditation every single time when I get in the car before I'm going anywhere. If I've got the time, which I usually do, and I'm honest with myself, I ask myself, do I really have time? five minutes to spare and usually the answer is yes and usually I find that I enjoy it so much that I make the time but I do a five minute meditation before driving anywhere especially if it's going to be a long drive it's even more likely that I make sure to do this but I, I do five minutes just I set the timer on my phone for five minutes I just sit there close my eyes and I focus on my breath 
and it's been really incredible. I feel so much more free, I, and it creates this space between the drive, which can be so stressful, and just I feel more spacious and free in my life because of it. So, highly recommend it. Just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for And you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it So take your eyes 